League of Women Voters of the United States is a nonpartisan voter education organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. It's the League's position that voting is a fundamental citizen right that must be guaranteed. Brews and Views presentations will not necessarily represent the League's views, but we believe in having a forum where community members and experts can educate us about various topics important to democracy. So Teresa, okay, Up, off to you. All right, hi everybody, welcome. I'm Teresa Reed, I'm co-chair of the program committee for the League of Women Voters of the Ann Arbor area. I have a lengthy opening tonight, partly because of this distinguished bio of our guest and because I get to welcome co-sponsors. So bear with me. Now we're here tonight for a special presentation, She Took Justice, The Black Woman Law and Power, 1619 to 1969, with Professor Gloria Brown Marshall. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Delta Psi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, by the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice, and by the Ann Arbor branch of the NAACP. We're very happy to have everybody here. Professor Brown Marshall opens her most recent book with these words. The black woman is extraordinary. These two stories reveal courage in the face of racial prejudice and gender oppression. The black woman fought enslavement in court. She challenged laws enacted to make her human property. She became an activist for her own freedom learned the law and became a judge. She used the law to liberate herself. This was done in the midst of terrorist intent on murder and few legal protections, yet she took justice. Her story is my story. Reading She Took Justice, I was repeatedly stunned by the courage and determination of these women, many of whom are little known. I was also stunned and sobered by this concentrated accounting of the often vicious legal obstacles the US government put in their paths. The perspective Professor Brown Marshall brings to 400 years of our history, the perspective of black women is as valuable as it is unusual. We should all know these women's names and their stories. This special event is in commemoration of the signing of the U.S. Declaration of Independence in recognition of both the power and the limitations of that document and in honor of the unappreciated contributions of Black women in the, uh, to the U.S. suffrage movement. Gloria Brown Marshall is professor of constitutional law at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the city of New York, of the city of New York. Um, City University of New York, I'm sorry. Professor Brown Marshall teaches classes in constitutional law, race and law, evidence, and gender and justice. She taught in the Africana Studies program at Vassar College prior to joining the faculty of John Jay. She's a civil rights attorney who's litigated cases for the Southern Poverty Law Center in Alabama, Community Legal Services in Philadelphia, and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Professor Brown Marshall has spoken on issues of law and justice in Ghana, Rwanda, England, Wales, Canada, South Africa, and before the United Nations in Geneva. In addition to She Took Justice, Professor Brown Marshall is the author of The Voting Rights War, published in 2017, and Race, Law, and American Society, published in 2013, as well as scores of articles in the academic and popular press. Professor Brown Marshall is also the author and producer of the 2021 short film, Dreams of Emmett Till. I'm also honored to be joined in the host chair this evening by representatives of our co-sponsors. Gail Walker Richardson is the president of the Delta Psi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. I'm going to I'm going to shorten that to AKA because we have a bunch of sisters here. The oldest black sorority in the US. After earning her graduate degree from the University of Michigan, Ms. Richardson spent 38 years teaching in the Ann Arbor Public Schools. 
Dr. Mary Hall Sham is on the executive committee of the Delta Psi Omega chapter of AKA and currently serves as a president of AKA's Pearls and Ivy Foundation. Dr. Hall Sham earned a doctorate in guidance and counseling from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Brittany Pendleton is an attorney in Royal Oak and the Connection Chairman for the Delta Psi Omega Chapter of AKA in Ann Arbor, where she expands the organization's advocacy footprint through community collaborations and events. Lauren Williams, joining us as a board member of the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice, is a nationally acclaimed and multiple award-winning storyteller who shares both original and traditional tales that appeal to a wide range of ages and social backgrounds. And William V. Hampton is a longtime community activist and president of the Ann Arbor branch of the NAACP. Finally, I get to turn the mic over to Professor Gloria Brown Marshall. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you, all of you. I like to say that with Zoom and the pandemic and the way that we can access so many different places, you could be anywhere right now. So for you to take your time out, I really appreciate it. I wanted to talk with you about She Took Justice because the Black woman, I believe, is extraordinary. The Black woman's story is extraordinary. And I want to begin my conversation with you where I intersect the Black women's journey with this journey around voting rights. We see um, our soror, uh, Kamala Harris, Vice President of the United States. We see the many Black women who are um, leaders of government. And as far as we are concerned in every area of American life, they are leaders, they are taking up leadership roles, they are participating, they are sharing their, their mind and sharing their creativity. Many people might suggest having turned some Southern states that had been liberal at some point in history, perhaps, I don't know exactly when, turning them blue was something that was happening overnight. But the Black presence, the Black female presence is one that's been around for a very long time. And I like to say that she liberated herself. And I wanna start this story of black women and voting rights, I want to start it in Africa and not starting it with enslavement as so many of our stories are started. I want to start with Queen Nzinga because Queen Nzinga, when you think about it, and the um, Angolan people, and I, and I talk about the Angolan people because when we talk about the 400th commemoration of the arrival of Africans in the Virginia colony, we're talking about Africans from Angola, not just anywhere, they're from Angola. And so let's begin with Queen Nzinga as a princess. Princess Nzinga is the daughter of the Angola, the king in Luanda. She is watching her father navigate the egos and conflicts of these tribal leaders from this area, some people have said is as large possibly of as Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Her father is the Angola, her father is the king, and she is watching him do these, these feats of diplomacy. And then arrive the Portuguese, not the English. The Portuguese are the first Europeans who are entering into um, the, the um, coast of Africa and Angola is located on the coast. Luanda is the capital. I've been there. I've stood on its hills and watched out to the ocean and pictured those ships coming in. And so here we have in the 1500s, the interaction of the Portuguese who have arrived as explorers at first and they're seeking gold and riches. And then they come back. And this time when they come back, they come back with an edict from the Pope that says that they can subjugate any people who are heathens. So they begin to foment violence within the tribal units. They begin to start to take away people first as prisoners of war from the conflicts taking place in Angola. And later on, Queen Nzinga is watching her brother who's now in Angola, 
after the passing of the father capitulate to the Portuguese. It's in 1622 that the brother sends in Zinga, his sister, to negotiate a peace treaty with the Portuguese in 1622. This is also on the UNESCO website, if you don't believe it actually happened, because all the stories I'm going to relate to you tonight are true. So here she is in 1622, arriving in her royal gown, oiled with the royal oils only her family is allowed to possess. She then arrives in Luanda for this meeting. Before her are array of these governors and, and his functionaries sitting on these high wooden chairs. How do I know? Because when I was in Luanda, you can go up to the fort and there are frescoes of this event. This was such a momentous occasion. Why? Because they had a mat on the floor for Queen Nzinga, a mat on the floor. She was either going to stand for this two day talk they were having to form this peace treaty, or she was sitting on the floor on a mat. Queen Nzinga in her mind says, I was born to royalty. They're treating me like I'm nothing. So she does this. And her maid servants come to her. They kneel down and they give their backs for a seat. And she gracefully sits on their backs and negotiates the peace treaty. This is where Black women come from. 1622. And it was in this time period she finds after they break this peace treaty that she becomes warrior queen in Zynga. And for her lifespan, and she dies in her sleep at age 80, she is so feared among the Portuguese for her warrior skills that she learned as a young girl and her diplomacy skills that she learned watching her father, that her name was recorded throughout the history of their time there. And that's why you see a 40 foot bronze statue of Nzinga in Luanda. But she did not win the battles. And so those Africans who were placed on the ship become the 20 and odd Negroes John Roth records in his journal as secretary of the Virginia, Col uh, Virginia colony, the Jamestown settlement. And he says that these 20 and odd Negroes arrive in August of 1619. This is one month after the creation of the House of Burgesses, the legislative body in the Jamestown colony. Why is this so important? Because they have now created their own law making body. But the lawyers and the other people who are part of this law making body are landholders. That land they find, they find there sustains tobacco. Tobacco is a very labor intensive crop. They have indentured servants. Those are the whites who are too poor to pay their way to the new world. And so they give of their labor for any time between five, seven to 13 years of indenturement in a labor contract. They work for free, considered to many white slaves. But after that contract ends, they're allowed to be free, but they become competition. And this is what it's all about. This is what it's always been about, competition because those Africans who arrive into Hampton, Virginia, and then into Jamestown, not only have they survived being kidnapped from their homeland, being placed into the belly of a slave ship there for weeks and weeks, and then finding their way into this new land where they have to learn the language, the economy, the culture, they do all of that and survive. This, I believe, is the threat. This is the threat that those English colonists see in the Africans and those lawmakers wanting no longer to have competition from white indentured servants, but they find that the law does not protect these African men, women, and children who are now being introduced into the colony. So they began to create their own laws for them. There's a debate as to what their legal status is in 1619. I put it this way. There were no slave laws in the colony at the time. 
you have the Powhatan Native Americans, you have the English and those from the United Kingdom, and you have the Africans. But the Africans do not have a diplomatic role here. There's no diplomacy that's protecting them. Therefore, the laws they create will be to subjugate them to perpetual servitude. How do they do this? Little by little, they enact law after law. One of those laws in the 1650s begins my first story. And that's the story of Elizabeth Key. Elizabeth Key is the daughter of an Englishman and Black Bess, an African. When we think about um, biracial today, we need to understand that biracial has been not just a term that we are using today, but something called mulatto was the biracial of that particular time period, and you see it in the law. You see it in the law, and people like me look for this because I actually go down to the Rockefeller archives in Williamsburg, Virginia, because I personally and professionally have no social life. So this is what I call a vacation, going to the archives, actually looking at legal, colonial legal history. And so I am there reading these things about Elizabeth Key. And Elizabeth Key now has her status in question. Her father has gone back to England and he left Elizabeth Key with a friend of his. This friend decides to subjugate her into slavery. She does something, of course, that becomes very American later on. She sues. She sues for her freedom. So one of the first lawsuits was brought in the 1650s by Elizabeth Key, who was suing for her freedom. How, who was helping her? A lawyer. She gets a lawyer. She sues for her freedom. And then even though she loses later, they decide to make this exceptional legislative movement and say she can have her freedom. And within the next year, they enact a law that says the status of any child born of an African woman will have the status of that woman. So now a baby in the, in the um, uterus of an African woman is enslaved in vitro. This is how early it begins. They also changed the inheritance laws. And so they said an African cannot inherit from his English or her English father. We go on to see other changes that are taking place. For example, in 1669, they say that an African who is killed by a European is not a victim of murder and that European will not be charged with a felony. Yes, 1669. That's how long they've been killing us with impunity. Here's another case I want to bring to your attention. Salem witch trials. Yes, it's in Salem that you hear about the witches of Salem, but you never hear about the black witches of Salem. And there were three black witches of Salem. And these black witches of Salem now are being accused of witchcraft by the same little white girls who are accusing the white women of witchcraft. These black witches are now watching this happen, or black alleged witches are watching this happen and thinking they're being accused of witchcraft and these white women who are accused of witchcraft are denying these accusations and being killed, being arrested and killed. What are these black women to do? We know that, that Tatuba is the woman from Barbados who was having a, a, just a, a time with the children in, the, in the, the forest because it was so boring in Salem and it was, it was so much work to do. So they found this little game that they would play. And Tatuba would tell stories about how it was in life in the Caribbean islands. And so the little girls then, one of them became sick. And then they said it must be witchcraft because they had been preaching these sermons of fire and brimstone. And they said, well, she must be a witch and she must be putting these curses on these girls. Now, these girls have such a boring, tedious life of just hard work. Here, they're allowed to stay in bed and then they become celebrities. Not only are they celebrities, they gain power. They know if they point to someone and say, she's bewitching me, that they will arrest these people. If you can imagine the power of that in a 10 or 12 year old girl. And so here now you have these two additional black women, Candy and Mary. And so, and I read from my book, 
just a little bit of the um, testimony that was given during the Salem witch trial and the cross-examination of Candy. Candy, are you a witch? Candy, no witch in her country. Candy's mother, no witch. Candy, no witch Barbados. This country mistress give Candy witch. Here's the crucial part. This is why I'm alive today to talk to you <laughs> because African-American women had to make a decision. People of African descent and other people of color as well, and probably almost all women, have to survey a situation and make a decision how they're going to survive it. How are they going to navigate power? And so what Candy did was to say, I'm not a witch. And if I am a witch, my mistress did it. She saw the women, remember, who denied being witches. What happened to them? They were hanged. She said, and we we're going to see this with Mary and her cross-examination. Mary was saying, no, I'm not a witch. But if I am a witch, I was given the witchcraft by the mistress. Here is how she saved her life, because all three of these women who were accused of witchcraft who are African-American survived. Why? Because they're saying, well, if they're killing the white women and they say they're not a witch, well, I'm going to say I am one. And then they said, oh, we'll pray over you. Okay. <laughs> and, and that's how they live. They had to be smart enough to realize denying it was not going to allow them to live. So they said yes, and then prayed over themselves and people prayed over them, took the witch out of them, and they were allowed to live. So we began to see how these women, because of the laws that oppress them by race as well as by gender, had to be so keen for their own survival. I want us to go forward to another story. And this is the story of Mary and Anthony Johnson. Mary and Anthony Johnson back in the Jamestown colony. But remember, Salem was in Massachusetts. And I'm going to be talking about different geographical places where these stories take place. And I, and I actually try to travel to these places as well. So I actually went to Salem to experience what it might have been like, you know, from the stories they were telling there in Salem, Massachusetts, of, of witchcraft and following the trails that they would had during that time period, that very short time period in 1654. But here's the other part I think that's, that's so important for us to understand. Oh, I'm sorry, in the six, other um, 1600s. But here's what I, I want you to understand about um, what was happening in the, the Virginia colony. The Virginia colony set the tone for the other colonies. It laid down the law because it was the first um, permanent English settlement. It laid down what the laws would be in the other colonies, so many other colonies. Now, it's not the oldest colony. Florida is actually the oldest colony, and it's a Spanish colony. So we have um, St. Augustine, which is the oldest area in the country as far as the colonies go. But that was controlled by Spain because we speak English, and this became an English country. We start our nation in the Virginia colony and the Jamestown settlement. And so we need to understand what is going on with the Jamestown colony or Jamestown settlement and the Africans who are there. Well, one, some of the Africans have gained their freedom. And that's why I said slavery did not mean everybody of African descent was enslaved, even in the beginning. Mary and Anthony Johnson married, had land of their own, and they also had European and African slaves of their own and servants of their own. Yes, in the 1600s. And I, and I use the word slave not in the same context that we use it today. They were servants, but the issue became whether or not they were servants for life. So they would be more readily considered servants than they were slaves, but many people have called them slaves. So what happened basically was that they, the um, House of Burgesses then enacts another law. This other law says no African can have any slaves. No Africans can have any slaves because Mary and Anthony Johnson had servants that some people said they were perpetually um, part of their labor. And so they were considered slaves. And I said, and I tell you this because there's a controversy around that to this very day. But I refer to them as servants. But they even passed a law that said no Africans could have white servants. 
This is all taking place in the 1600s. So I want you to think about Mary and Anthony Johnson, who are, are from Angola. Their names, of course, in Angola were, were not Mary and Anthony Johnson. What they were doing in Angola, and if you go there, you'll find there's a church on a hill that looks out over to the ocean. And the Jesuit or Catholic um, nuns or Catholic um, priests were actually um, baptizing the Africans before they put them on the ship. Baptizing them, taking away their African natural names and giving them Portuguese names. And so we have people who have been given Portuguese names arriving into the colony of Virginia and then the names are changed to English names. And that's how so many names were lost because those names were taken while they were in Africa, changed again when they arrived in, in, into um, North America called the New World. And so when we think about Mary and Anthony Johnson, we think about, well, where would they be today since they had land of their own, servants of their own? How do I know this? Because there was a hater neighbor who actually burned down their farm because he couldn't stand the fact that Africans had this property. So he burned their, set their farm on, on their um, barn on fire. And so they lost so much and they asked for a tax abatement. And when asking for this tax abatement, they had to list all of their property. That's why we know Mary and Anthony Johnson existed. We know they had property of their own and we know they had servants of their own but they started changing so many of the laws, little by little taken away by 1680, the right to self-defense. They took away the right for anybody to actually defend themselves if they were African. So remember 1669, they had already taken away, you know, any type of felony that would befall a European who killed an African. By 1680, they take away the right of any African to actually have any sword or club or gun or any type of weapon, but also if they raise their hand against a Christian, and that's what they called um, Europeans then, any Christian, then they would receive 30 lashes on the bare back, well laid on. And if they defied their, their master, defied any white person, they could be killed. And where did they put this notice of this law? On the church door. They put it on the church door. And it was on the church door every 30 days to make sure that every African knew and every person in that colony knew. This is how they began to put the places where somebody is under someone else. And we also have, we have to understand, if they ran away, they would come be brought back. And this is where we begin the, the form and foundation of our policing system. Because if any indigenous servant or any um, African um, laborer ran away, they were brought back by bounty hunters. And so now we have the foundation of what we're dealing with today. We have the bounty hunters, which became our police forces. We have the, the murder of Africans with impunity. We have the taking away of the right of self-defense. We have the children born of the African mothers now being enslaved in, in vitro. And we have the continued use of law in order to subjugate people of color, whether Native American or Africans, into a place of lesser than status until we get to 1705. And by 1705, we have chattel slavery. And chattel means property, movable property. So human beings are now considered movable property by 1705. But of course, you have to read between the lines to understand if in 1669, the Europeans were allowed to um, kill an African, that meant Africans were rising up and defending themselves. If you have a law in 1680, and a law against self-defense, that means these Africans were defending themselves. That means that husbands were defending their wives and parents were defending their children and parents. And so we have to understand that in between all of these laws is the story of so many Africans, in addition to the stories outright based on law and in law lawyers and courts write things down and that's how we can have these stories because they write down the testimony just like the testimony you heard in the, the cases of the salem witch trials they also write down what happens in the court case and that is something that we can all go back and read 
So I want to very quickly go to a couple of cases in which people are fighting back and finding their own agency during this time period. I want to talk about Wentworth Cheswell. And Wentworth Cheswell is a man of African descent in 1768 who becomes constable in Newmarket, New Hampshire. Yes, he runs for political office and he gains that office and he becomes a constable of that city and he is of African descent and this is 1768. So we need to understand that people are standing up, people are still trying to have, you know, fulfilled lives. There are a small number, relatively small number of free Africans. The majority of Africans in, in this time um, are enslaved, but there are also different ways in which you have in New York, they call this semi-free, that there were people of African descent who had certain freedoms that were of a greater range than those people who might have been in Maryland or Texas. But I want to talk about um, Mumbet, and Mumbet is an enslaved African woman with her sister in Massachusetts, and she's working for the Ashley family. And the, the um, slave mistress is a very ill-tempered, spoiled brat woman. And mom, Bet and her sister had been given to the Ashley family as a wedding gift. Yes, they used to give people as wedding gifts. And so she's working there and, this, and her sister breaks off a little crust of bread off of, because they're so hungry. And she's eating a little crust of bread off of the cornbread. And this, this um, slave mistress comes in and says, oh, you're stealing from me. How dare you steal from me? She picks up, the slave mistress picks up this red hot iron and she then throws it at Mom Bet's little sister. Mom Bet puts up her arm to save her sister and the the iron hits Mom Bet's arm as they say it goes down to the bone. Mom Bet is then in bed with a fever. They think she's going to die. She lives and they had dinner parties because these were people who were very well known. At these dinner parties, Mom Bet then shows up to serve the food. She's very sick and weak, but she shows up anyway. She refuses to put a bandage on her arm that has this gash in it from the hot stick. And then the slave mistress says, please cover that up. Nobody wants to see it. Mom Bet says, no, I want them all to see what you did. I want us to understand that people were not just sitting back, allowing things to happen. Yes, they wanted to live. And there was always that balance between fighting back and having to take the abuse. And too often, of course, abuse had to be taken. But Mom Bet then hears a proclamation of the Massachusetts Constitution talking about freedom. She hears people in her so-called owner's home talking about freedom. And so she then is going to the market and she passes by a lawyer's office. And Mom Bet walks into the lawyer's office and says, I want to sue for this freedom you have under the Constitution. Yes, she brings a lawsuit. And in 1781, she wins her lawsuit and wins her freedom in 1781 under the Massachusetts Constitution. She then is free. And this quote is what she says, any time while I was a slave, if one minute's freedom had been offered to me and I had been told I must die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it just to stand one minute on God's earth, a free woman. She changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman and she was known as someone who was very charitable, but she also freed her little sister and she never went back to the Ashley home again. We need to understand that there were many stories like this one, but because the law writes these stories down, the other stories we really don't know much about. And so that's why she took justice as just that, taking justice, not waiting for it to happen, there were many freedom cases. Freedom cases were cases that were brought by people who had escaped slavery, many women who had escaped slavery and were caught by bounty hunters. And because they escaped slavery, for example, out of Missouri into the free territory of Illinois, or they were taken into this free territory, they said, I'm free by the fact that I have been in this free territory. And many of these women won their lawsuits by freedom cases. 
Yes, they brought these cases and found lawyers to bring cases on their behalf. Many of you know about Sojourner Truth and Sojourner Truth is a woman of such power. She stood six foot tall and she said when she had worked long enough and she had been promised her freedom again and again and hadn't gained it, that she finally left. And Mum Bet said she left, she didn't run away. She didn't run away from slavery, she left. That's her quote. And so she said, I left by day. So this is, this is, I'm sorry, Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth said she left by day. She did not hide, she did not run, she walked away by daylight. And Sojourner Truth brought four different lawsuits. Sojourner Truth decided that she would be called Sojourner Truth. She named herself. She said this is what the path that God had for her, and she named herself. And what Sojourner Truth really is, I think her first name was Isabella uh, Bumfrey. That was her name when she was in prison. One of the lawsuits she brought was for her son, Peter. So what would happen? Peter was free. They would capture, could kidnap free Africans and sell them into slavery in the South. Now, how would one prove that they were free? How would one prove it? So, so many times it was their word against this, these, these people who were, of course, so diabolical that they would kidnap a free person, that they would lie and say this person was enslaved and they're selling them for someone else or selling them themselves. And so Sojourner Truth actually brought a lawsuit against the person she found out had kidnapped her son, Peter, and she got her son back. But Peter on his back was filled with marks and beatings that this man had done to him. And I'll say, and I'll read this to you. Fowler had severely beaten Peter and threatened further punishment unless he denied Truth was his mother. He denied her and cried out as if his mother was some terrible monster and his master a kind parent. However, Truth persisted. The court ruled that the boy had been seized and sold out of state and gave him to a lawyer named Deman. He in turn gave the boy to Sojourner Truth. When Truth examined her son's back, she could only weep for the pain he had endured. Peter's back was covered with whelps from beatings from the leather, with a leather whip. He was bruised from being kicked. Not satisfied with abusing Africans, Fowler would then viciously beat to death his own wife, Eliza. So what we have here is a wife beater, someone who committed murder by beating his own wife to death, who had kidnapped Peter and was beating him as well. So if Sojourner Truth had not gotten her son, he probably would have been killed at the hands of Fowler as well. Sojourner Truth also brought a, a lawsuit for defamation. She was a minister and one person she knew had, had, had died and she, they blamed her and they said that she must have done it. This was another thing that, that happened to many black women, especially those women who were enslaved. If, since they were the cooks, if anyone got sick, violently ill or died, they would think that she poisoned them. Now, you know, I'm, she might have, but what I'm saying is it, for the most part, there's no evidence of this. And yet, whenever there was some type of illness, they would blame her. And so they started to blame Sojourner Truth for the death of this person. And so she sued for defamation and won. So we have to understand the power of the black woman and the power of, and there are two other lawsuits, the, the power that they took for themselves. No one is saying, yes, you can. They're saying, and I, and I look at it this way, there's a little light of humanity burning inside of them that they are keeping secret and they're holding it dear. And that little light they can't show in their eyes they can't express in their, their thoughts to anyone because you don't know who might sell them out. You don't know when this, even a benevolent slaveholder might turn on them. But here you now have this little light and the, the black women who are here are the evidence of that little light that was kept alive throughout all of the torment and torture that she was forced to endure. That little light and that little faith that one day she would have more is what gave rise to generation after generation of women who have a belief in themselves, even if no one else 
believes in us. I want to also talk about 1848. And of course, many of you know about Seneca Falls and about in 1848 when the meeting of women and that meeting of women in Seneca Falls in upstate New York was one in which they declared their rights, but there were no black women at this meeting. Now, Sojourner Truth was also located in upstate New York. So why wasn't she invited? This question around the division between black women and white women and this quest for equality is something that is probably a vestige of what some of the conflicts are to this day between black women and white women, because the white women, the white suffragettes or suffragists um, wanted equality, but when black women wanted to be a part of that same equality movement, they were turned away. It is so in Sojourner Truth, in Akron, Ohio, at a convention of white women suffragists that she then gives her famous Ain't I a Woman speech. So the whole idea, if we're all in this together as women, ain't I a woman? So therefore, should I not be with you? We go forward with black women deciding as we have to all the time. Well, if you're not going to be for me, I will be for myself and me and God make a majority and we are going to create our own organizations. And that's what black women do. They go forward with their own suffragist organizations. But the Civil War happens in the Civil War between 1861 and 1865 gives rise to the 13th Amendment the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment gives Black men the right to vote. This, of course, was a major controversy at the time. White women thought they should gain the right to vote before Black men. This becomes a major controversy along many lines, and things were said by um, suffer white suffragettes about Black men that we're still living with today. And some of them were, I would rather give my right arm then give the black man the right to vote before a white woman. This sense that a black man and black people altogether should be subjugated by people who themselves are being subjugated is also the conflict that we have again and again in history in this country, that people then want to pull up the ladder once they rise to a certain level. And the issue, of course, is very complex, but it comes down to um, one in which we have um, Black women who are saying, and this is, if white women with all their natural and acquired advantages need the ballot, the right protective of all other rights, if Anglo-Saxons have been helped by it, how much more do Black Americans, male and female, need the strong defense of a vote to help secure them their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? So you have a number of Black women saying, Black, white women, you should understand that we are being subjugated more so than even you, and therefore the right to vote is necessary. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, except as punishment for a crime. The 14th Amendment, the first line, is where you get citizenship at birth. You also get privileges and immunities, due process, and equal protection. That 15th Amendment gives Black men the right to vote, and they do. Black men vote. And Black men have, in 1870, the first Black U.S. Senator, Hiram Revels. There are Black U.S. Senators, Black U.S. Representatives. There are over 4,000 Black men in political and government offices between 1870 and 1890. What happens? The Ku Klux Klan, the John Birch Society. And at the same time, though, in 1872, you have the first Black woman lawyer, Charlotte Ray. You have Black people who have out of slavery, not turning and, and trying to get revenge on white people, but looking at all the resources that they have to gain in order to have a foothold in this country since they were denied 40 acres and a mule. So you have these colleges like Spelman, Hampton, Howard, all of these places that are created for higher education. Remember, there were Black educated people in the 1850s, Wilberforce, and Black women who had attended Oberlin back in the 1850s. So they didn't begin to have education, but they had it in great numbers. 
Prior to this time, of course, by law, people who were enslaved were forbidden to read and write by penalty of death. But now you have people hungry for education. So you have all of these resources that are being put together with the Freeman's Bureau that's part of the government that are that's there in the Deep South. But by 1877, it's the end of Reconstruction. They have pulled back the, the federal troops that have been protecting Black people and Black rights. And now you have the rise of um, laws, segregationist laws, but also of brutality. This nation has subjugated or attempted to subjugate Black people by law and violence. By law and violence. By law and violence. So when law is not working, that's when you see the violence. By 1882, you began to see lynching taking place on a regular basis. And as we go forward in 1890, that's when you have the Mississippi Plan. The Mississippi Plan is a plan that was created to undermine the powerful role of the Black vote. The Black vote is powerful in the 1870s. Ulysses S. Grant is elected on the Black vote. The Black vote can change the outcome of elections. And that's why they meet and they have the Mississippi Plan and the Mississippi Convention changes their constitution to create the grandfather clause, literacy tests, and poll taxes in the 1890 Mississippi Plan. Then other states began to adopt the Mississippi Plan. Vardaman, and Vardaman is... James Kimball Vardaman, late governor of the state and of, of Mississippi and a U.S. senator, he removed all doubt. Now I'm reading from my book, The Voting Rights War. He removed all doubt, and I quote, there, this is him speaking. There is no use to equivocate or lie about the matter. Mississippi's constitutional convention was held for no other purpose than to eliminate the N-word from politics, not the ignorant but the n-word end quote he made it very clear why they created these things and so by by 1900 you have such a difference in the political landscape because in 1896 plessy versus ferguson created separate but equal and racial segregation across the board it was open season on black people and on black political rights so in 1890 in louisiana the state where we have plessy versus ferguson arise you in 1890 there are over a hundred thousand black registered voters by 1900 that number is five thousand because in between you had the Mississippi plan and you also had Plessy versus Ferguson. And so after that, through law and violence, through the lynching of black people, through the rape of black women, you begin to see the horrible retribution that the South and parts of the North are having when they think about the power that black people have and how they want to undermine that power. Now we have the riot, the race riot in Springfield, Illinois, the birthplace or homeland, I would say, of Lincoln. And because of that Springfield, Illinois race riot, we had the rise of the NAACP that was started in New York City and then was finally created wholeheartedly in 1909, as many of you on this um, um, of Zoom um, presentation, no. And so one of their tenets is political rights. The first case that is brought before the US Supreme Court that the NAACP is a part of that wins is the case of Wynn versus United States that rules that the grandfather clause is unconstitutional. So as you go forward, we have case after case. There was a time where the um, Democratic primary in Texas, which was the heart of many cases, was considered a private club. And so if they excluded Africans in Texas, that was fine. Those cases went before the US Supreme Court. Louise Lassiter and so many other black women brought these cases to try to stop poll taxes, to try to stop literacy tests. All of these things were cases that were brought by black people and black women. You had them fighting again and again, trying to make a headway using law when they discovered as they did in the 1650s that law could be used as a tool that they could press against what they thought was oppression. So they're pressing against oppression using the rule of law. 
Here's something that I think is very important to understand as well. When we think about law, we think about our first lawyer in 1872 and so many other, the black female lawyers coming through. 1872 with Charlotte Ray, the first black female lawyer graduate of Howard Law School. We have to realize that black women are watching the oppressive, oppressive laws that are crushing, crushing them. And one of these most oppressive laws are criminal laws because the criminal laws are not protecting them. Black women are being raped, black women are being abused, and yet there is no law protecting them. And so when you look at some of these cases in my book, She Took Justice, and you find that black women have been not just used and abused during enslavement, but also left unprotected by law after slavery ends. And so they are the, the victim of gang raped by white people, white men, and prosecutors are doing nothing. And one of my major issues, and if you have a chance to read it, I have a, an op-ed piece that's, um, that's actually running on the Bloomberg Legal News. And this op-ed piece speaks of the failure of prosecutors to actually you do their job when it came to violence against people of African descent. And so this violence by white people against black people has been one in which prosecutors have turned their back for centuries. And so when we're dealing with the vestiges and the vestiges are the remnants of what's left over from this earlier time period, we see in criminal injustice. Remember the bounty hunters, the slave catchers, the night riders, all of those people became the foundation for our police forces. They say our police force began with the bobbies of England, but that is not true. It began in, when they included, yes, the bobbies from England through Boston and New York, but the, the South had already created its own sheriffs and those sheriffs had their foundation in slavery and in Jim Crow oppression. So our criminal justice system that we have today that has been one that is rooted deeply in a race-based system of oppression of people of color is one that we're still wrestling with. And that's why you could have a George Floyd. That's why you can have police officers who kill with abandon because they've been allowed to kill with abandon since 1669. We need to understand what kind of criminal justice system we have and we don't have. What January 6th showed us was that people who through law and violence want what they want when they want it, when it comes to their role in this country. But when it comes to the role of African-Americans as full citizens, and especially African-American women, there is, of course, this pushback that African-American women have decided to continue to go forward no matter what. And I end with this, and I know that I've gone over my time, but I wanted to end with just the sense of the poem of the caged bird written by activist, actress, and poet Maya Angelou expresses a soulful cry for freedom. Her last stanza tells of the quest within the spirit of all people, especially those who have restricted by law and tradition like the black woman. The last stanza of the poem, Caged Bird states, the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And this, his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. African-American women, even if their song was inside, has always been one of freedom, will continue to be one of freedom. And when Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman to be a member of Congress, it was her song of freedom that led to this in 1969. And her foundation gives what we have today in Kamala Harris as Vice President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. There's so much there. Um, and I still have more in my notes that I want to ask you about. Right now, I want to invite Gail and uh, Mary and Brittany and Laron and William to unmute yourselves and participate. And as I said uh, before we started the program, just jump in. Uh, if we bump into each other, that's okay. We'll just we'll just work it out. Um, I had I have as I mentioned to you, Gloria. I have a few notes. I mean, I have a lot of notes from the book, but I pulled out a few that I wanted to specifically ask you about, um, especially um, the way they reflect on law. Or and the way law has affected um, uh, everything. <laughs> Sorry, um, Margaret Garner. I, I mean, can you speak about Margaret Garner briefly? Margaret Garner um, 
is a, a an enslaved African woman who um, is the mother of a little girl and her baby girl is is one that she knows will be subjected to the same racial harassment and the same brutality that Margaret Garner has experienced. And so she takes her little girl and she crosses the Ohio River and she tries to escape with her. And when the people find out, the bounty hunters find out and, and chase her down, she decides to kill her daughter before she would have her enslaved. And so she kills her daughter. The case goes before the court. Did she kill a human being? Or did she kill property? That's the issue before the court. So we need to understand the diabolical nature of enslavement, what black women had to do, what they had to contend with. And, you know, and Margaret Garner um, was found that she had killed property. They did not want to even give this dead child humanity and allow her to be a human being killed by her own mother, nor would they allow any of these people to testify on their own behalf. No person of color was allowed to testify in a criminal court against a white person. So she was not even allowed to tell her own story, why she would take the life of her own child. In so many of the cases that you'll read about in my book, you'll find this happens again and again. Celia, for example, who killed her master was not allowed to testify. So many of these women had to just take it. And so when we get into the time period after slavery ends, it's also expected that black women are just going to take it. And they don't. And there are cases in which these black women rise up and kill white men. And it's thought of, oh, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen. How could you do something so horrific as to kill somebody white? And if, without even thinking of all the, the tens of thousands, probably millions of people who have died at the hands of white people over this time period. And I don't want to jump. I want to give everybody a chance to jump in. I, I have both a question and a statement. And um, I'll start with the statement. I. I just wanted to first of all thank Gloria for for her all her books and and uh, for giving us this wonderful background. The two thoughts are going through my mind, and I'd like, to, if I may, with your permission, to add to the statement that you just made. You said something about us understanding the diabolical nature of enslavement of slavery. I'd like to add a couple of other words: diabolical, insidious, and pervasive nature of enslavement and the history of slavery. And the, the thought that I, I think of so much is that somewhere along the line, decisions were made to perpetuate this system, to keep it going at the same time that decisions were made to make it seem as if the ideals of democracy that we put forth as a nation were the truth about the nation. When they weren't, obviously they were a lie. We, I think everybody assembled here knows that. But somehow that powerful story of inclusion, the powerful story of freedom, the powerful, and I'll just add the words often repeated story of liberty and equality and justice, those stories somehow have had the strength to maintain themselves down through our history. I often think about the story, I know all of you have heard it, about George Washington chopping down that cherry tree. I'm sure everybody here has heard it at least once in our lifetimes. I grew up hearing it. And when I go into schools today, 2020, 2021, and I mention that story to young children, they have heard the story of George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, ostensibly because he could not tell a lie. But the story itself is a lie. It never actually happened. And not only that, we know who wrote the story. We know why he created the story. These are not obscure, obscure realities. And yet the story continues to be repeated. And the reason that I think this is so important is that there are two realities. So I don't want to, the, the pervasive, insist, insidious, and, 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 and horrible diabolical story of slavery is very, very, it is the truth. It is the reality of what we've lived. But the counter to that has been so strong that we have people who now insist that the last election wasn't, didn't wow. actually happen the way it did. We have people who believe in this massive, 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 massive lie about our nation. And so the challenge, the question that I have is, 
how do we combat that? You know, what do we collectively, I'm happy to see so many people here, faces I recognize, how do we collectively combat that massive lie that continues to be told? I, I think that what we're doing right now is part of it. Um, I would say also, and George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, people know that they don't know that it was a lie. They also don't know that Oni Judd was a slave enslaved woman who worked for George Washington, who ran away and she ran away and um, he tried to get her back and she wouldn't return. And he was so insulted. Like, how could you not want to work for the president of the United States as an enslaved person? That she would rather have her freedom than work in the household of the, of, of the president of the United States. And what George Washington used to do in Philadelphia, this is when the Capitol was in Philadelphia, he would um, take the enslaved people down to Virginia because under Pennsylvania law, if a person is enslaved there for longer than six months, then they become free. So every six months, he would take everybody the day before, he would leave the state and take everybody back down to Virginia. This is how sneaky this man is. And then he would bring them back up and then have them there for another almost six months to the day and then take them out of the state again. And he did this during his presidency while the, while the, the capital was in Pennsylvania. And so Oni Judd left and we was, he, she cooked dinner and then she walked out the back door with just the clothes on her back. And um, and she escaped, and he's and George Washington so embarrassed himself trying to get this black woman to come back that people finally told him, "You are humiliating yourself as president of the United States," because he was so enraged that she would leave. And um, he sent once again bounty hunters after her, and white people protected her and other and other black people. So we need to understand that. Um, I always say there have always been a handful of white people who have believed in justice and put themselves in harm's way. The number should have been greater. So, so many people, as Martin Luther King said, are the quiet ones, the silent ones who sit back and do nothing and just watch. So we need to understand, even when we're talking about slavery and insidious diabolical things that happened during slavery, after slavery, the, the idea of the, the lynchings that took place in this country. We burn people alive in this country. And mm -hmm. I'm not talking about in the 1800s either. And then they took pictures of it. Where were the prosecutors? There are pictures of people laughing and smiling under the hanging bodies. Where were the prosecutors? So I want us to understand that this country has a diabolical nature that it believes it can step away from. But as you pointed out, people are going to continue to remind this country, no, you did this and you gave yourself the evidence because you took the photographs of yourself committing the acts. And now we're using that evidence that you took of yourself against you to remind you of your diabolical deeds that you can't just step away from. And one last point I'll make on this, we don't allow other countries to step away from it. I've been to Pearl Harbor and I'm sure some of you have too. When we have been in war and we have lost people like the World Trade Center and I'm in New York City, we then recount these losses. We remind people. So why aren't we allowed to remind people of their, of their cruelty and of the losses that we've sustained? And without reminding people of these losses, then, of course, as many of us know, then this could be repeated in the future. And in many forms, it has been. And that's why we had such a backlash to George Floyd's murder. I'm, my, my brain is on two different things and somebody else jump in. But one, um, Laurent, I was thinking about in terms of your highlighting the dis difference, the gap between the story we tell about ourselves and the facts. I don't think it might be because um, one of the things that uh, I was I read in the book that I I didn't fully remember was that um, Thomas Jefferson, when he took Sally Hummings as his concubine, I've read that. I don't know how you how you describe her. She was fourteen, I mm -hmm. believe. Fourteen. He was forty four. And she was his wife's half sister. sister. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. whom we hold up. And so, I mean, these are stories that are I, people don't want to know. 
Well, I, I had an opportunity earlier today to speak on a panel for the National Archives about the Declaration of Independence. And they asked me to sum up my thoughts and I said hypocrisy, because that is what is happening. And you cannot step away from hypocrisy. All you can do is try to right the wrong in the time period we have to right the wrong. And that means, mm -hmm. and somebody put in the chat, you know, people keep trying to rewrite history to make themselves right. You cannot make this right. What, the, what people wanted was to create a country out of colonies. And in order to do that, they thought of an economic machine, an engine, and that economic engine was slavery. Yeah. And everything that was involved in slavery. And that meant breeding black women. That meant killing people, maiming them if they refused to work. That meant subjugating people over generation and generation and then making them into the worst types of human beings in somebody's mind and depiction. And that way you can treat them wholeheartedly with disdain. And the Dred Scott decision goes there in, in so many ways and shapes and forms. If you ever have a chance to read it, it's despicable in its way in which it, it subjugates black people in law. And, and therefore allowing people to think, well, I can treat people in this manner because they're less than human. And they're always thought of as less than human. And he knew when he wrote it, it was a lie. So that's the point. People are saying and doing things they know are lies when they're saying it and doing it and perpetuating this. And people have this sense of, of the of power of, of, of flight, the power of walking away, the power of being blind and of, of remaining ignorant to what is actually going on. And as long as they can have that, that power of escape from the truth, they're continue to use it and will end up generation after generation with those who want to believe the lie that was perpetuated. It was a lie when it was stated and continues to be held out as the truth. William, did you want to speak? I do. Uh, first of all, um, your, your presentation was extraordinary. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'd like to ask a question that's just a little bit off topic. Uh, if you would care to respond to it. Uh, I have some real, uh, I have some real major thoughts about qualified immunity, and I was wondering if you take a moment, if you would, and share your thoughts about the pros and cons, if there are any, of qualified immunity. Well, qualified immunity is what government officials receive. That means that um, unless they are operating outside of the color of of law. That means that they were doing something completely outside of what their job detailed, then they are protected against civil liability. Qualified immunity is used in the context of police officers um, in our daily conversations about the George Floyd case, because in so many instances, police officers who take a life, for example, or injure some, a civilian, if there is a civil lawsuit, not the criminal suit, that's brought by the prosecutors, in a civil lawsuit against a government employee, the police, the government employee is protected by qualified immunity, which means that they are not going to be sued in their individual capacity. So even though that individual police officer committed um, the act, it's the city and the police department that's going to be sued. And when that city and police department is sued successfully and there's a damage award because it's a civil case, there are damages awarded and money damages, that money comes out of our taxpayers' pocket. So we are actually paying for the harm that was committed by this individual. No money is coming out of their pocket unless that their job, like the police department decides to fire them, which is rare. There have been only 42 non-federal cases involving police officers in this country, 42. Over a thousand people die at the hands of police every year since they started keeping data. And that's only been in the last 10 years. And you can go to the Washington Post website and find information on what it is I'm saying. And so that once again, I say prosecutors are not doing their job. They are zealous advocates on behalf of the community when it comes on to civilian on civilian crimes. But when it comes to police officers and police involved civilian cases, prosecutors turn their back on their responsibility. Yes. The standard is high in criminal justice. If a prosecutor, I mean, the prosecutor feels that a police officer feared for their life, and then the, the police officer is allowed to use deadly force only when encountering deadly force. 
Unfortunately, we rarely have an instance like the George Floyd case with Derek Chauvin when an officer has to explain how they fear for their life. I want to know in broad daylight with the Michael Brown case in Ferguson, Missouri, how that officer feared for his life. What did he think Michael Brown was going to do on that street with the distance between them? What did these people think that Tamir Rice was going to do? When you start having to ask these officers this question, you find that the prosecutors will not put the officer in a situation in which that officer has to actually explain their behavior. And so qualified immunity is different because it's civil than it is the, than the criminal case in which we see the actual officers, um, possibly as in the, in the Derek Chauvin case, having a criminal incarceration consequence if they are found guilty. There's only a money damage or no money damages in a civil case involving qualified immunity. But qualified immunity, the reason why it's the, the pro for qualified immunity is that most government employees and many of you teachers, um, uh, people who work for the IRS, anyone would feel that they could not do their job if at any point they could be sued in their individual capacity. That's why qualified immunity is used, but prosecutors have absolute immunity and so do judges. So you can't sue them for, for civil liability at all. So they're allowed to do this and never lose their jobs. They might get unelected, but that's about it. And that's only the people at the very top. Everyone else is a government employee covered by a union and they get their jobs. Even when the Supreme Court has found they've acted with outright racial animus, these prosecutors have still kept their jobs. I have a question here from the chat that I'd like to ask you. And then I also wanna come back to on the 13th Amendment. <laughs> um, here's a question from the chat. What current issues of today might lead to court cases that will influence or move the needle on civil rights or be recounted by historians of the future? It's got to be criminal justice. Mm -hmm. Criminal justice is the number one issue today. And it, it, it is that issue. And the reason why I'm a proponent in full disclosure of national criminal justice reform, national criminal justice reform, and here's why. It took national reform, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in order for the women here and people of color to have jobs in which there was some protection. Because the 1964 Civil Rights Act said that there could not be discrimination based on race, color, um, religion, and sex. And, and national origin. Also, the uh, Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was national reform. And because of that national reform, you had the rise of Black politicians, the rise of participation politically, and the, the power of the Black vote that was finally realized, as you see today. Um, you had the 1968 Fair Housing Act, national legislation to protect the ability to choose where one is able to live, national um, um, reform is necessary in criminal justice because the root of it goes deep into slavery. It goes deep into Jim Crow segregation, into night riders, into terrorism. And so there's got to be national criminal justice reform. You can't have a progressive prosecutor here or there. Those are political jobs. And once those jobs are lost, that means that prosecutors are no longer able to um, do this progressive work. Thanks for that. I think this is this ties right into something I wanted to get back to. You had mentioned that the Thirteenth Amendment passed in 1865, um, outlawed slavery, except in the case of um, conviction of a crime, right? Yes. Criminal conviction. And I think most of the people on this meeting have probably read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can speak to how that exception in the 13th Amendment led to the Black Codes in the South? But initially it didn't until um, the South that had been devastated by the Civil War needed to be rebuilt. Remember the federal troops had been withdrawn in 1877. And so in order for it to be rebuilt, it needed labor. And they, you know, people had gotten used to getting from African-Americans for free, but they now did not want to pay for labor. And so they figured out that based on this um, 
conscript conscription within the 13th Amendment of, of having enslavement if someone is, is, is convicted of a crime, they began to use the criminal justice system to do just that, convict people of crimes during the time period of planting, during the time period of harvest, when labor was necessary. And now, and many of us, of course, have seen the Shawshank Redemption. We know that the wardens were a part of this in which they were getting rich by leasing out the inmates. And this is the convict lease system, the convict lease system that was in place until World War II. Birmingham Steel, one third of the people who worked at Birmingham Steel were the people part of the convict lease system. Two years ago, they found a mass grave in Texas where there were 48 bodies or remains of 48 people. Those people had been part of the convict lease system. They thought no one cared. If you want to watch something, Slavery by Another Name is a video that's on YouTube, excellent video. And there's a book, of course, Slavery by Another Name. And it speaks to just that, the convict lease system. And so men, women, and children who were African-American were scooped up on bogus charges called the black codes or criminal laws created just for them. And then they would use these people in, their, in for one to five years in their labor and abuse them horribly, kill them if they wanted to. And there was nothing that was really said up until World War II. And so what they did was to say, if we pay you, it's not slavery. So that's why people who are incarcerated today are paid like 10 cents an hour. And so once they're paid any minimum amount of money, it's not considered slavery. And that's why they pay what to such a minimal amount. Corporations are using incarcerated people to do jobs that are being done by people on the outside and they're paying them 30 cents, a dollar. And those same people, once they have completed their sentences, cannot get jobs in those same corporations doing the same, the same thing. These are some of the things we need to work on. These are some of the issues. We need to force these corporations to hire these same people who are working for them when they were incarcerated. The other thing we have is called a, a civil death. And a civil death means that a person loses their right to vote. There are certain states where people still lose their right to vote if they have a felony conviction. They lose their right to vote if they're on probation or if they're on parole. They lose their right to vote. And so they have a civil death, meaning that civilly they're not alive. They don't have any voice in their community. Now we also have people who are on parole, some people for 5, 10, 15 years. Can you imagine being on parole for 15 years where you're living the entire time thinking one instance they can go back to incarceration? So they're letting people out, but they're putting them on these very lengthy periods of parole. And during that time period, they do not have the right to vote. So there's so much that we have to do along the lines of good behavior. And that's what they put in. So good behavior under the Constitution, states create the standards for voting. And that's why Indiana could come up with a photo ID. Texas could have a photo ID with another requirement for what they require the photo ID to be. So then each state could have its own requirement. And so as long as these requirements are not discriminatory on their face, then they're seen as, well, if it's equal to everybody, then we're not discriminating against any particular person. But they already know that Democrats and they know that people of color, they know that poor people and people who are older find it very difficult to get to these places where they can get the type of photo ID that's necessary for them to vote. They know that each time there's an instance and an obstacle, it's going to cut down the number of people who vote. And so all of these things are done intentionally to undermine the vote. So that this nexus between criminal justice and the vote is a very important one. And the last point I'll make with that is prison gerrymandering prison gerrymandering. And what they do is put the prisons in these places that are very rural and they're far away from the center of, the, of, of actual cities. And they count the people in those prisons as part of the population in order to have better benefits from the federal, state, and local governments. And those, those jurisdictions where the, the industry has left and now the prison is the industry. And that's where we get the prison industrial complex. And those people then are not taking into account the needs of those people incarcerated. So it's very much like the three-fifths rule in the Constitution. Right. 
highlighting uh, all of that highlights your um, argument that we need federal laws, <laughs> not, mm -hmm. not state and local laws. Um, would somebody put in the um, chat um, the URL for um, the voting voting, what is it, voting access for all coalition here? Um, because prison gerrymandering is one of their uh, big, uh, one of their big um, pushes. So uh, voting access for all coalition, it's VAAC. If somebody would put that in the chat, that'd be great. Um, our co-sponsors- You can also put my um, 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 She Took Justice book link in the chat. And if you, mm -hmm. if you buy the book on Routledge's site, that's the publisher, Routledge, then you can get 20% off. And the code is FLR40. FLR40. That's the code that can get you 20% off of the book on the Routledge site. And once again, it's F as in Frank, L as in Larry, R as in resources, <laughs> 40. And that's the, the discount code. Great. Thank you. Co-sponsors, any more questions? I have I have two. I have one. They're both too long. Okay, good. Mary. Yeah, I have one and I know that I'm I'm sure you can't start it, but I wanted to thank you for telling the story that you have and the history that you've given. But in the next couple of seconds, could you tell us from reconstruction to voter suppression? what the playbook that was written in the 1870s and how they took away voting rights is tied to the current voter suppression plan that we are all engaged in and being subjected to now and the gutting of the Civil uh, Voting Rights Act in 2013. So in your last uh, couple of minutes, could you tie that story in as to how we can reverse that trend? Yes, as I said, it was during the elections following enslavement that that the black vote was shown to be so powerful that there was a meeting in 1890. How can we undermine the black vote? As I told you, the quote from Vardaman. So they come up with something all the time. It's two steps forward, one step back. Always the power going forward and then look for the backlash by law and by violence. You see this backlash. And so the Colfax massacre, for example, in the 1800s, in which hundreds of black people who were meeting to try to figure out how to best use their political power were attacked by a white mob. And that case went to the US Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court said, well, they didn't attack them for voting. They attacked them after they had voted. So they're not protected under the civil rights law. So you see, once again, law, and violence. You go forward with that, and I've talked about after the um, the the case of, of of Plessy versus Ferguson, and how violence when people were going to the polls, and there was no protection. The sheriff didn't protect them, and the sheriff. You have to also remember this: the, to pay the poll tax in order to vote, people had to pay a tax. The poll tax. Mm -hmm. The poll tax was located to pay it in the sheriff's office. Marcus. So going to the sheriff's office signaled to everybody you were a troublemaker and therefore the person could be killed, that's their cattle true. was poisoned, their farm was burned down. Fannie Lou Hamer, that's a, a perfect example of someone who learned she had the right to vote. And when she registered or attempted to register to vote, she came home and everything she had was thrown out into the street, about into a dirt road. And she was mm -hmm. not allowed to work there anymore. So when you go forward, you begin to see she was beaten when she was registered people to vote. She was taken to jail and beaten. Her life was shortened by the beating that she sustained while she was in jail that time because she was being she was registering people to vote and actually being a full citizen by law and by power of violence. And what you saw on January 6th, that mm -hmm. was the violence. Those were the types of mobs that used to attack people. And in my book, She Took Justice, I actually named the black women who have been lynched. And there have been hundreds of black women lynched as well. Not as many as black men, but hundreds of black women lynched. You can go online and see Mary Turner. There have pictures, they took pictures of this. So we need to understand these pictures exist, but it's by law and violence. And so we have to counter law with law. 
And we have to protect ourselves from the violence and realize when we go two steps forward, look for the backlash and do not expect, as we saw with two terms of Barack Obama, what do we get? One term of Donald Trump, two steps forward, one step back. So keep that in mind, always prepare for the backlash. Don't go in leading with your chin. Know that this country is in a voting rights war that this country is going to do what it can to maintain a white supremacy. And I'll go with this for one step further. The future, Sankofa, you have to know your past to understand your present, to plan for the future. The future, if they have their way, is of apartheid. That's why you're seeing the foundation that's being laid right now in the Supreme Court and with voting rights. Because by the year 2045, the US Census has already said this country is going to be majority people of color. And so in order to maintain white superiority by immigration, there were always quotas to lower the number of people from places of color immigrating into this country. And so you're going to see this battle for white supremacy going into the next generation. And I want to make sure you understand that conservatives, and if you're economic conservative, then maybe I'm not talking about you, but there are people who are planning generationally, generationally, too many progressives plan until the next election. That, Mary, is not going to work. That game plan is not going to work. You're going to have to not just battle against something. You have to decide what you're for. And you're going to have to battle for something. Because we are so reactive. We keep reacting to what other people do. You need to have a game plan and work your game plan and have a, 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 an understanding that there's going to be a backlash. Just because it's right and good doesn't mean they're going to let it stand. I just wanted to add one comment, which is that I don't think we, as the more liberal groups in America, have explored our economic power. I think that we are playing games. It goes right along with what you just said with um, planning, not planning for the long distant future. We have a lot of economic power and we know that corporations run the government or a big part of it. And if we can use that power, that's one piece of power that we have not explored the use of. We spend our money in different places, but not so that it makes a difference in terms of government. And African-American activists have certainly used the power of the purse many times. Many so ways, civil rights. Mm-hmm. The win really important rights. And I'd like, um, to, I'd like to end with a, a quote from Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth said, if women want more rights than they got, then they need to just take them and not be talking right. about it. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. That's great. Absolutely. That's great. Um, I'd like to I don't end- know how much more time we have left, but I would like to introduce introduce one piece that I, so uh, thank you, Mary, for starting where you did with the, the origins, if you will, of the current voting rights, uh, restrictions on voting rights, the current form of those restrictions on voting rights. But I wanna place all of this in a much larger context. And that's why I really appreciate it, Gloria, that you start back in the 1600s when this country first came into being and that long succession of laws that were put into place that sort of massaged us as a nation and got us ready to support a kind of separation that was beneficial to a small number of people who arrived here, the planter class, the owner class, the property class of of people who eventually came to be called white. I wanna mention the 1676 rebellion, Bacon's rebellion, which sent fear through the hearts of those landowners. And they came up with a solution, which was to make sure that if you were people of different colors, that and you united in rebellion, you would be punished very differently for your rebellion such that it would not be advisable for you to cooperate and try to rebel. And they in 1640, they, they separated, there were three uh, in, uh, indentured servants who escaped together, two white, one black. They gave the black indentured servant much, well, they gave him life. And the two mm-hmm. white guys, they gave a shorter extension John to Punch. their, pardon? John, John that's Punch. right, John Punch. And, um, and, and 
they laid the foundation not only for a physical condition of separation, but they began to insinuate this ideology. It wasn't simply attached to the doors of the churches. It was read from the steps of the churches because bunches of people were illiterate. And so the mandatory reading of those, those uh, laws, those slave codes and so on, became a part of our collective culture. It continues to this day that race is a tool that has repeatedly been used to separate people who are living in a common condition, but because they see themselves as different colors, they don't unite. And that's why, Gail, we don't use our economic power collectively because we see that person over there as our enemy and that person over there that we're working right next to them, but we see them as enemies. That's why they can't get a union in the doggone uh, uh, automotive plant. That's why they can't get unions throughout a lot of places in the South because race is being used as a tool to separate us and, and to keep but us also, from seeing it coming. But, but, but Laron, I would add this yeah. other point that I think also gets mixed, missed, um, that we are worthy allies seeking worthy allies. Mm -hmm. We need to toot our own horns a little more to make Absolutely. sure that people, because it's like, right. we don't need allies based on sympathy because they're not going to stay. Mm -mm. We need it understood that we are proven and African-American women are a proven entity. Right. So we are worthy allies seeking worthy allies. And I always like to say to women generally, don't be a cheap political date. As LaRoz pointed out, demand mm -hmm. something. Stop giving your, your vote away. You know, it's like, don't be a cheap political day. Get dinner, get something. <laughs> but it's like so often you have, you know, women, it's like, I'm just so glad that I'm in the room in order for us to work mm -hmm. together. You know, we need to be able to go into the room with a list of demands. This is what I want for my vote. This is what I want for the power that I bring to this room. This is, and, and the other hand of it is, and this is what I'm going to do to you if you decide to cross me or double cross me. We've got to have consequences. And I, I love Barack Obama, but he did not know how to spank people. You have to be able to make people feel some type of, of, of revenge or a consequence if they do cross you. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, try to be nice. And nice is nice until it's not. No. So you need to make, them, make sure they understand, yes, this is nice me, and nice me is going to leave if you double cross me. And and women have not been doing enough of this. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to be more like Queen and Zynga, the warrior yes. queen. Yes. Yes. And you know, Queen and Zynga's brother died under suspicious circumstances. <laughs> I'm not throwing oh, any well. I'm just telling you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> By any means necessary. <laughs> That's how she became queen. <laughs> Speaking of being spanked, <laughs> I'm going to be spanked if I don't um, close this meeting. Close it off. I know, but it was wonderful. It, it was, was wonderful. So wonderful. Thank you. Come on. We could obviously talk for a very long time. Long time. I would have to love have back. to. I would just love to. So, Gloria, this has been incredibly um, engaging and informative. And I, I wanted to ask you about Polly Murray. Uh, you wrote Polly Murray was a genius, which I just, it was brilliant. And that kind of speaks to Laurent's question about how do we get out of this? And then the other thing I want to put this in the chat, the story of Callie House and Isaiah Dickerson and the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association is just mind boggling in 1894. So those were things I would have asked if we had another two well, hours. Callie, if you think about reparations, the request for reparations began right after slavery. Callie House is a name people should know. She was per the person who was a leader of the reparations movement that she was asking, demanding for pensions for former enslaved people in the 1890s. And what did they do? They said it was fraud, like Marcus Garvey that she was committing mail fraud and they then convicted her and she went to federal prison. Yes, mm -hmm. Callie House. And Polly Murray was a genius. She was a lawyer. She would have graduated as the top of her class from Howard, but for the discrimination, gender discrimination at Howard Law School. Yes, gentlemen. And so she went on to be one of the founders of the National Organization for Women. She also was an Episcopal priest and she brought a lawsuit because in Alabama, at one point, no women could sit on a jury. 
And so she was one of the women who actually brought a lawsuit in Alabama, in Lowndes County, bloody Lowndes County. Um, and she risked her life to bring this lawsuit because she knew that African-American women on a jury would be powerful. And so she won that case. It didn't go to the Supreme Court. She was disappointed that she didn't get to argue before the Supreme Court, but she won that case. And she's also been the author of many books. Thank you so, so much. I, um, I've poured over yours, your latest one. And I have a lot more to go back to on that. So thank you so much. Oh my gosh, um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to repeat that um, uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan voter education organization, and that the uh, views and what you hear here um, we're offering is education and does not imply an endorsement. I have to say that. Or speaking of getting spanked. So um, uh, thank you everybody for joining us for Brews and Views. Thank you to our co-sponsors. Thank you for, yes. thank you, Professor. Yes. Just thank amazing. I hope um, you can, she took justice. I really, and, <laughs> and the code FLR40 for the 20% discount on the Routledge site. So you have to go to the publisher Routledge. F as in Frank, L as in Larry, R as in restitution and reparations. FLR40, <laughs> 40, 40. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Night, everybody. Hi. I want to thank our intrepid tech team, Nancy Bruffin and Susan Bully. And I want to point out that next month we begin our quarterly series on criminal justice reform mm. and restorative justice in Washtenaw County. On the July 14th, we'll be joined by Belinda Doolin, who is executive director of the county's dispute resolution center, and Victoria Burton Harris, chief assistant prosecutor for Prosecute. Washtenaw County. These two African-American women are in the forefront of criminal justice reform here. So we are very happy to be having, having them next week, next month, July 14th. We hope you'll join us. Look for details via email and on our website, lwvannarbor.org or the Facebook page, facebook.com, LWVAAA. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks to all of our co-sponsors. Thank you, Sora. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night.